time being 2.03, uh, let's go ahead and call this meeting to order. Somewhere here, hang on, I'm sorry, I have my agenda, here it is. Um, so let's do introductions. And um, so I'm just gonna go around and the commissioners that I see, I'm going to call on and please just introduce yourself. Again, I'm uh, Tillamon County Commissioner Dave Yamamoto. Uh, Commissioner Banks. Clatsop County Commissioner Courtney Banks. Thank you, Commissioner Scar. Tillamon County Commissioner Aaron Scar. Commissioner Tucker. Lynn County Commissioner Will Tucker. Commissioner Magruder. Columbia County Commissioner Margaret Magruder. Commissioner Maine. Coos County Commissioner Bob Maine. Commissioner Weiss. Nancy Wise, Benton County. Commissioner Sweet. Commissioner Sweet, Coos County. Commissioner Thompson. Commissioner Thompson, um, the backup to the delegate from Clatsop County. All commissioners are always welcome to our FTLAC meetings. That, that's those, I believe those are all the commissioners I see on my screen, uh, but who am I missing that may have called in or um, is not on the screen? Any, any other commissioners? <laughs> So let me go over and do some VIPs here. So uh, we have uh, Mike Buffo, Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Mike Buffo, uh, Senior Forest House with Mason Bruce and Gerard. Thank you. Uh, Dina. Dina Nickel, Executive Director of Association of Working Thank you. Uh, Mark Rasmussen. Hi, this is Mark Rasmussen at Mason Bruce and Gerard. And so again, those are the ones I see on the screen. Who have I missed? And I apologize if I have missed anyone. Is Board Chair Kelly going to be able to uh, join us this afternoon? Um, uh, oh, sorry, Cal. You go ahead. Well, I talked to him this morning, uh, Chair, uh, Chair Yamamoto. And uh, he has a family obligation this afternoon, a long play of family obligation. So he sends his apologies. I understand. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll, since you're unmuted, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Okay. I think that was to you, Cal. Oh, you are muted. Sorry about that. I, I thought you said something now. <laughs> I should put the headphones on. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm Cal McMahon, I'm State Forester, and I'm welcoming you to this meeting. I'm very happy to be welcome to this meeting and uh, appreciate the work that you do for uh, advice, helping us advise us on management of state lands. Um, as we all know, we're at past 4th of July, and we should be, and we should be in the heart of fire season right now. Uh, and yet uh, we've been very lucky. We have the wildfire council over here at the Tillamook room right now meeting and I stepped in there. And fire is still a very top topic for us. Yesterday I went out with three local associations into the field and we have a lot of flashing here from all this great rain that we're receiving. Um, but it's still very wet. And so we're very lucky there. Although we did have one uh, a pretty large fire uh, east in eastern Oregon that was put, I think it's pretty well under control right now. Uh, one of the things that's going to happen on Monday, all our ODF districts will be in fire season. And so we will all be there. And we do that largely because, uh, you know, because of burnt outside burning issues and uh, logging, you know, uh, being able to put logging controls when, and especially if we go into the late, July and started entering into August, we might not get those lightning storms like we got this week or last early this week where we have a lot of rain. We'll start maybe get those dry lightning storms and those are the worst ones. So, you know, I know commissioners, you talk to a lot of folks out there. And so if you can just kind of give them the Smokey Bear uh, talk, I'd appreciate that. And so with that, as I said, Chair Kelly sends his regrets and I think he'd be much more interesting than me, but. Uh, I appreciate you allowing me to be here and listen and uh, and uh, have 
uh, wish you a good meeting. Thank you, Kel. Appreciate that so much. So, uh, let's go back to Mike Wilson. Mike, introduce yourself, please, and introduce uh, staff members that you may have online, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Yamamoto. Uh, I'm Mike Wilson. I'm the State Force Division Chief. And uh, with me from ODF today, uh, we have Ron Zilli. Good afternoon, everyone. Ron Zilli serves as the Deputy Division Chief for Planning. And Justin Buttress. Good afternoon. Uh, Justin Buttress, Policy Analyst in the State Forest Division. And Cindy Kolomechuk. Good afternoon, everyone. Cindy Kolomechuk, and I serve as the Project Manager for the Western Oregon State Forest HCP. And we have Andy White. Hello, folks. Andy White, Northwest Oregon Area Director out of Forest Grove. And Ola. Good afternoon, everyone. Ola Book, Western Lane District Forester. Okay, and I think I also see Brandy. Thanks, Mike. Brandy Ritter, Executive Support, standing in for Samantha Hoffman for support behind the scenes. And let's see, Todd Heron. Good afternoon, I'm Todd Heron, I'm the uh, Forest Resource Analyst with the State Forest. And am I missing anybody from ODF? I think I see Jason. Oh, Jason. Good afternoon, uh, Jason Cox, ODF Public Affairs. Wouldn't want to forget the host of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Michael Curran and Chet Bailing. Oh, okay. Michael, yep, and then Chet. Yeah, Michael Curran, uh, the district forester for the West Oregon District. Good afternoon, everyone. Chet Beeling, I'm the assistant district forester for the Western Lane District. Okay, who, who have we forgotten? Um, I, see, I see Mallory Roberts is online from, from AOC. Mallory? Thank you, Chair Yamamoto. Mallory Roberts, AOC Legislative Director. Um, I see Doug Robertson. Doug. Maybe it's going to be basketball. Ralph, you, I, I see you here. Ralph, please. Ralph Saperstein representing Boise Cascade and Associate Oregon Loggers, member of the public. Thank you for being here. Um, who else have we missed? This is your chance. This is me again. Sorry. I, Commissioner Willie's having trouble getting into the meeting. It says 403 forbidden when he clicks on the link. So um, he's trying to get in. Um, I don't know if that's a, our problem or <laughs> what. So um, anyway, just flagging. Thank, I appreciate that information. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, we need to get them. And you, you might uh, tell um, Commissioner Willie that if he can't get in, uh, he can probably call in. I know that's not um, that's not the best way, but if he can't if he can't log in virtually, then he, he may try calling. Okay, thank um, you, uh, Chair Yamamoto, um, Commissioners. I put the meeting link in the chat. Um, I don't know if that will help or not, but maybe the link got corrupted originally somewhere along the way. So maybe uh, email him that the commissioner that and it might help. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that. Uh, anyone else we're missing? I don't know if we're uh, introducing everybody, but uh, Tom yes. Riggs, manager of Clackamas County Parks and Forestry, just here to observe. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you being here very much. Yeah. Anyone else want to introduce themselves? Okay, so uh, let's move on in our agenda. Uh, if I can find it again, here it is. Um, so we went through introductions. Do we have any public comment? Do you have public comment? If you could raise your hand and uh, we'll get to you.
Uh, Commissioner, I'm seeing no virtual hands raised. I will review the video to see if there are physical hands raised or waving. <laughs> uh, there appears to be uh, no one uh, signed up for public comment today, Commissioner. Thank you for that, Jason. I appreciate that very much. I do. Okay, so um, comments from the Board of Forestry Chair and or State Forester. So, Cal, I take it you, you've already done that? So I, I jumped the gun. More time? Chair, I jumped the gun, so no need to repeat. <laughs> Thank you so much again for being here. Okay, so we're going to move on to the, the meat of our, of our meeting, uh, formulating testimony for our July 20 Board of Forestry meeting. And, and before I forget, so I do want to do this before I forget. Uh, I would love to be able to testify before the Board of Forestry on the 20th. Uh, I am heading to Denver for the NACO, the National Association of Counties annual meeting. My flight leaves about one o'clock, which means I've got to be at the airport by about 11 or 11.30 or so. Um, so I'm wondering, Michael, if you can arrange it that I can do my testimony in the morning. I, I know we normally ask for it in the afternoon, but that's because normally on Wednesdays, uh, the Telma County Commission has their board meetings on Wednesdays. So if that's possible, I would appreciate that so much. Uh, Any time in the morning, uh, Commissioner? Well, so I, again, so if I need to be at the airport by 1130, I should leave by 930 or 10. And so if I leave from home, it's going to be like 9 or 9.30. If I go into the courthouse and leave from the courthouse, I can leave as late as 10. Is that possible? Uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do to get that as early on the agenda as possible. I yeah, I'll that. do that with Michael. I think, I think that could be arranged given the topics we have that morning. I think they're fungible. I didn't say fun. I said fungible. <laughs> I understand. Thank you so much for that. I, I, I do appreciate that so much. Okay, so um, formulating testimony before the Board of Forestry. Um, so there were thoughts that maybe we should cancel these meetings since there are no agenda items uh, specifically for FTLAC uh, that are going to be on the Board of Forestry agenda. Uh, but I know we're coming up to, to some, some very quick points. Uh, we've been working on this HCP for quite some time. Um, so I just felt it best if we utilize this time to continue to address the Board of Forestry on issues that are important to us, uh, even though there's, there may or may not be something on the agenda uh, that we're going to be um, um, addressing directly. Um, so this is just kind of an open forum uh, for issues, issues that we have. Um, so I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start. I hope, I hope you don't mind. So the September Board of Forestry meeting, I, I'm a little confused as to exactly what is going to be determined at that Board of Forestry meeting when it comes to the HCP. Uh, I've heard it was going to be a major decision point moving forward where the board was gonna give a thumbs up, thumbs down as to whether we were gonna move forward uh, on, on the um, HCP. Uh, then I've heard that maybe that may not be the case. Uh, this is just an inflection point, if, if you will. Um, tied into that, uh, of course, um, public comment on the HCP uh, ended on June 1st. And it's my understanding that the department has received well over 3,000 public comments, including FTLAC's public comment. I think it's difficult to call that just a single public comment, because our public comment was many, many pages. Um, and, and then I'm not sure when and who is doing the compilation of the public comments to be presented to the board. And I don't know when that might occur. And then even with the public comment compilation, I know there has to be some sort of response to the public comments. And so I'm just wondering how all of this fits in to the September Board of Forestry meeting and whether that really allows everyone an appropriate amount of time. So I know that that's a bunch of different questions all rolled into one, um, but uh, if someone can address that, and, and Cal, you might be the perfect one to address that. I, I, don't, I don't know who sets these things 
uh, as far as timing goes for the Board of Forestry? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair. I think I'm going to hand this one over to Michael because he's been in the more in the planning and uh, determination through the work plan on this. So, Michael, can you address those questions? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, pleasure. Yeah, Commissioner Yamamoto. Um, the uh, so the, the process is, as, as you, uh, you're correct, the comment period opened and uh, the federal NEPA comment period closed on Ju June 1st. And so we are in the process, uh, well, the contractor's really in the process on either end that there's a separate, uh, ICF is handling both contracts, but there is a NEPA team and there's an HCP team and they're two separate entities. They are doing the work now of, uh, parsing out the comments as to which apply to the HCP and which apply to the draft EIS. And they are <clears throat> uh, summarizing that. We're working with them uh, to help summarize those comments. And we will be taking those to the board in September. Uh, September is uh, not a major capital D decision point. Um, we will present the board with that summary and uh, receive any board direction that they choose to give us uh, at, that, at that September meeting. Um, you are correct, there is a large volume of comments. And so it is, it is quite, a, quite a bit of work um, on that. So that's, uh, that's what will happen at the, at the September meeting. Um, and I'm sorry, did I forget any? You had a multi-part question there. Did I it, miss it? It was a multi-part question. So what, one of the other issues, you know, these comments, uh, either, either the feds or the department or both are going to have to respond to the public oh. comments. And, and I'm wondering how that might happen and when that might happen. Um, Cause this is all going to be, be important for the board to make any kind of a decision uh, in September, even if it's a small D decision. Right. So the, the board's re uh, response to comments that are addressed, you know, specifically to them, uh, such as, you know, in, including uh, your testimony or other input they might get from other venues is, is kind of uh, as they choose to respond to it. Um, you know, they are at liberty to kind of respond to that at any point in September um, uh, or otherwise. Um, the federal process, specifically the comments that went into that process, they are uh, dealt with individually. There's an individual response to each comment submitted, and that is part of the final EIS. And so those comments may range uh, from uh, something like, oh, hey, good point. This helps us improve the analysis, and this is what we did to address that. Uh, all the way to, I mean, obviously in these kinds of processes, there's a lot of comments that are just out of scope. And so it's kind of like, okay, yeah, this, and this comment's out of scope. And, but each, each comment gets its own individual um, response, whether or not it actually ends up having an effect on the final environmental impact statement. So how will you know those comments other, so, the Board of Forestry is going to have to wait for the final EIS before they know how each comment is is replied to. And, and only on the only on the federal side. Now that that doesn't change the nature of, of any sort of comment or input or testimony that they receive uh, just directly to them. Uh, you know, for instance, every time you give your testimony. Um, anytime any one of you chooses to reach out to the board uh, with a letter or comment or, or however, um, they can respond to that in real time, or they can, you know, basically respond to it as, uh, you know, they might respond to it right there, they might respond to it later, but they're not on any specific schedule um, like the feds are, and it's not tied to, uh, you know, how they take your input and respond to it. it's not tied to the the federal uh, process at all. Okay. So, for well, instance, some of the some of the concerns that you've raised may come out in the in the EIS, but those concerns can also be addressed directly to the board. You know, of course, and, and I know you're doing that as well, and they can respond to that in in real time. 
by speaking of responding in real, in real time. So I know this is an FGLAC meeting, the FGLAC board, but any commissioner uh, that belongs to a trust county, please um, feel free to interject, ask questions about answers we're getting, or if you have your own your own questions, please feel free just, just to jump in. I hate silence. Well, Commissioner Banks here. I was being polite and raising my hand. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not seeing hands raised, so. That's Please fair enough. Please fair enough. Um, I did. Uh, you made a comment about the length and, and breadth of our our public comment that the board members, we oh. as a uh, Forest Trust Land Committee members, sent and and I remind folks that it's not just our voice as a singular person. It is the voice of the thousands that we represent. And so for me, Clatsop County, it's the well being of 42,000 plus, um, and also for Commissioner Thompson. And I, it, it, I just like to point that out that um, we're in this position because people are believing in us to, to help try to carry the voice of many. And, and so when reading these comments and, and, and reflecting on the questions that I ask, um, I'm asking for 42,000 people. I'm not just asking for myself. Um, and to get back to questions, I submitted a lot of emails to Mike, bless his heart. Um, <laughs> and he, he tried to respond. Um, and, and so I am going to try to keep it short and simple today. Um, when, when looking at our HCAs in, inside this draft EIS plan, um, I see that riparian zones have a lot of scientific documentation cited for the, the width, the breadth, um, you know, uh, shadowing over the creeks for, for cooler temperatures and so on and so forth. So a lot of scientific research has gone and, and was cited within the documentation has gone into um, identifying why those riparian zones are the size that they are. When I look at the size and the scope of the HCAs, um, I don't see an equitable or equal um, citation within the, within the document that says, this is why we chose that. Um, I don't see why the scale and the scope was chosen. Um, I can't identify what scientific process was used uh, to, to create the size and breadth of these HCAs as alternatively I can see with the riparian zones. So I was just curious of what scientific process um, that hasn't been cited uh, that we used or you used in order to establish the why, I guess. Why is it this big? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question, Commissioner Bangs. Um, so when it was really more based on where we know we have sites, we do have home range, uh, you know, information uh, generally. So it is a little difficult. It's a little more complex uh, in some ways to try and ferret that out when you're trying to uh, map out a, basically a landscape design uh, for the terrestrial species. We do know, you know, of course we, we have the, uh, uh, we have a wealth of data on where sites are and have been in the past and, and, and various attributes of those sites like the reproductive history and whatnot. Some of those sites we were fortunate enough to have actual telemetry data on. So we know something about um, well, at least on owls, at least uh, how owls might use that landscape um, and what those home range sizes look like at that time for those birds. No guarantee that they're used the same way by you know, any individual pair. Um, so it's not quite as straightforward, um, if you will, as the riparian uh, conservation area designs where you know, there's a lot of um, you know, research to show how much shading you know, might be adequate, what kind of temperature 
you know, a specific target around a temperature rise that we were trying to ameliorate before it hit fish water and that, that sort of things. Um, so um, there is some, you know, professional judgment in there as well as, as you know, there's not really a rote prescription on how to, on how to define those areas. It is more straightforward with RCAs. I think there's a little bit of questions still around riparian conservation areas as well, um, but they're given the, I guess, you know, the, the, the fact that they are drawn along a linear feature makes it easier. Like we, we could debate, you know, what, what was the buffer that we need for a potential debris flow track to make sure that it, you know, delivers wood and is a properly functioning thing if the slope fails and, and, and that sort of deal. Um, but at least the, the overall sort of uh, nature of it is along a linear feature. So that helps. It is more complex with um, species that aren't necessarily tied to that. And so our best information at that time was uh, site use, both current and historical, um, by, those, by those terrestrial species. I, I, you know, thank you for the response. I guess it brings to mind a concern that I have is that is the HCA size and locations reflective of opinions of the small group of voices in the room developing the plan, or was it cited to scientific measurement, scientific data that can support the decision made. So with, again, the riparian zones, there's a plethora of scientific data that was cited within this document that showed that it is supportive of the decisions being made. I didn't see that in the corridors or in the HCA. So I guess my concern as a commissioner is, I'm, I'm actually kind of jealous of our, our private forest accord friends just because um, they were able to be involved in the process. And so we're stuck, sadly, in a position of asking questions after the fact, um, not, asking, not asking these questions as the plan is being developed. So I, since nobody's willing to share with me like the number of voices in the room or, or who had the county's backs when this plan was being developed, I, I fear because there's not scientific notations um, that support these decisions that, that it's a matter of a, a personal opinion and making decisions with such breadth and potential fallout. Um, I, I would really love to see the science, like send me the notations, send me the scientific calculations, send me the results of, of said, um, research studies that support the enormous size that these HCAs are. I guess that, that's where, that's my hope. And, and it's not so much for me at this point because I can't make a decision, I'm not allowed. Um, but it's for answering the, your board members because we've had some board members that have, have expressed, you know, some data concerns. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that we can show them the science that says that this is the right choice. So that's my first question. Um, I'll let another commissioner or fellow person take, take a stab at more questions and then I have, I have one more. Thank you, Commissioner Banks. Before we ask another question, I wanna welcome Commissioner Willie uh, from Washington County. I see Commissioner Willie has joined us. Thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it very much. Uh, other questions, so uh, let me ask another one here. <laughs> so since we're talking about HCAs, uh, of course, uh, FTLAC was very disappointed uh, that uh, our H HCP alternative was not uh, considered. Uh, we still believe, I feel strongly, that barred owl control is uh, probably the most important factor in trying to save the spotted owl, uh, putting aside hundreds of thousands of acres alone, and we just don't feel it's going to do it. At the same time, when we talked initially about why our alternative uh, was, was not accepted, uh, we were told that, well, there, there has been additional language added from the department uh, about barred owl control, and yet it's very nonspecific. Uh, do you have specific plans on how you are going to control or attempt to control the barred owl? 
Uh, Commissioner Yamamoto, um, uh, the way that, so it is a little bit uh, generalized, uh, in, but really ties back to the Bardow management strategy um, that's being developed. And so, you know, there is a federal effort, uh, large scale region wide effort to come up with that Bardow management strategy and plan. And, you know, we, our efforts will live inside of that. Um, and that is a guiding, uh, guiding document. You know, we've been involved in the Bardow management uh, strategy team since its inception, um, as a lot of other uh, uh, landowners have. And, you know, given that the, basically the uh, objectives of that are the same across ownerships. I mean, the only reason anybody's going out there and trying to control barred owls, um, especially given that these control measures, uh, there are suggestions beyond the lethal measures, but they are lethal measures and not something we take lightly. Um, you know, the, our objectives are in line with that larger effort. And so the actual implementation of that um, will depend a little bit. I mean, we do have the commitment, a hard commitment on funding for that effort uh, on, uh, on state forests. Um, exactly how it pans out over the permit term will depend. I guess I would liken it sort of to, you know, there's a forest management plan, then there's an implementation plan. So there'd be an actual implementation plan for the barred owl management uh, strategy at some point, and, and we would be part of that uh, development. And, you know, from our standpoint, uh, with the draft HCP as, you know, regardless of how it sort of comes out final, whatever habitat conservation areas we have that are intended to su support spotted owls in the future would be the primary emphasis for us on making sure that habitat is actually available to spotted owls. And so um, if there's somewhere, you know, uh, as part of that implementation, that's where our control efforts would, would focus. And, and I, I just have to say, I mean, I appreciate that you're waiting on, on the federal barred owl control regimen to come into place, but I don't see how you can make decisions on trying to, in, in our HCP, how you can try to say that you're going to control, uh, you're going to revive the spotted owl species by waiting for a plan from the federal government that really is not in place yet, and yet you're basing a large portion of this HCP on recovery of the spotted owl. And you really don't have a plan in place other than, and you'll excuse me, but other than previous failed attempts by the federal government to, to revive the spotted owl simply by increasing habitat. Uh, so again, I, I just think there's a missing piece here um, that you're relying on an unwritten, untested federal barred owl control process uh, to save the spotted owl in our HCP, a 70 year HCP. And if it proves not to be effective, the federal plan, uh, again, we're kind of stuck here with, with a 70 year HCP. And to me, that, that really just, it doesn't sit well with me. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be angry or mean here. It, it just doesn't make sense. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner. You know, I, I really do think there's a, I think that's a valid point. What if plans of a lot of different, you know, uh, plans perhaps don't come to fruition? Uh, that's part of the uh, dealing with the future. Um, so I'll just give you an off the cuff answer uh, from my perspective. Um, if, we, if there is no larger federal effort, and I feel strongly there will be, uh, they've, been lead, they've been the tip of the spear on the research uh, part of this in the first place. But if there isn't one, uh, then we would be in a position of going to, and it's recognized in our HCP, then we do have a firm backing to be able to go and say, look, we're gonna do this ourselves. You know, we are going to pursue this. Um, and I have a feeling that there might be some other landowners that would like to be involved in that as well. 
but we do have the latitude to go and pursue it ourselves. The difficulty it does for uh, that it uh, has for us is, you know, we'd have to do our own navigation through the Migratory Bird Treaty Act um, to be able to get a take permit for barred owls, essentially. Um, but you know, I mean, I mean, it is possible to do without the federal. Well, they'd have to approve that, but. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, even if they don't have the cohesive management strategy we like, there's other mechanisms where we could do it. In that case, we would not be entirely alone as ODF. We would certainly be coordinating with ODFW uh, and, and carrying that out. Um, and actually, when it comes to those kinds of permits, um, you know, the, the, it may be that the state is a general permit holder. It may not be us. And I don't know exactly how all that plays out. Uh, I've seen it. I've seen it done different ways with different types of permits uh, over the years. But anyway, uh, we would still make the effort to carry that out because, like you, um, we recognize the the need for barred owl control. And I'll be the first one to say it, say it here. There's no point in growing habitat if we're not going to have that habitat be available to the species. I 100% agree. So, and this is the first time I've heard, and, and maybe it is true. I, I don't know. So you would you would be, be somebody. In Oregon would be required to have a barred owl take permit in, in order in order to uh, to control the barred owl? Yes, uh, virtually all species um, of birds are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, so the same reason you can't just go out in your yard and shoot an American robin, uh, that's illegal. Um, and it's illegal for, for barred owls as well. Hmm. Um, there's very few species that that doesn't apply to and, and it would be uh, for species that are actually not native to basically this, the continent uh, really like starlings, uh, house sparrows and, the, and those types of things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, any, any native species. And in this case, even though barred owls are invasive in air quotes to the Pacific Northwest and having that effect in the Pacific Northwest um, they're not considered an invasive species in the same way that, um, say, European starlings are. And so, anyway, any any native any native bird uh, that's not a game bird and that's a different regulation is uh, under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, even if they're not migratory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but the, but they are, I guess. They're they're migrating <laughs> here anyway. But thank you for that, Michael. Okay, I'll I'll shut up for a while. So this is not my second question, but it's just a continuing a, a continuation of what Commissioner Yamamoto is, is speaking of um, in this current conversation. Um, Oregon State University did a study uh, with California, Washington, and Oregon, and it was close to a 20-year study um, on barred owl mitigation and how it impacts spotted owl across the landscape. Um, and what they found was it does not bring an increase in spotted owl population. Um, and so when I'm thinking about something that I feel, find very ethically challenging for me, which would be mitigation of a healthy species. Um, and I, when there's, after 20 years, I'm 17, te technically it's 17 years. After 17 years, close to a third of our, our plan period, um, that research study did not show the population to grow. It actually continues to decrease, but the decrease slowed. Now, what I find the part that is ethically challenging for me, and what I was not going to speak about today, was that we have a healthy species, which is the barred owl. Granted, it is an invasive species, but it's a healthy species. Um, and so it's mitigating, killing, it's killing, a, killing off a healthy species, healthy established species in order for a population to hopefully come back even after research shows that it's not going to. And so that is what I find ethically challenging. Um, as some people here know, um, I know Commissioner Thompson knows, we have an elk herd mitigation plan in order to bring health and well-being back to our current elk herds in our in our area. Um, and we've worked closely with ODF and W to make sure that we are doing this responsibly, um, that it's food and fiber, 
that it's not so ethically challenging. And so I guess that's, I just wanna put that out there, um, that, that this plan shows that we are gonna be doing something that is, that is ethically challenging um, without scientific data supporting that it is going to bring back a population. The scientific data that we have found or that I have found shows that that population will continue to decrease. Basically, we're slowing the decrease of the population, but we're not getting rid of it. So what happens? We shoot hundreds of thousands of barred owls. We kill them. Hundreds of thousands of barred owls a year on the hopes that one or two spotted owls establish. So what happens the next year? Do we continue this process on the hopes that an owl may have eggs? And then five years, more barred owls, because what, what federal services stated was that the barred owl will continue to come. And so we're gonna do 70 years of killing, basically, with no, on, on hopes. And I, so again, I'm just putting it out there. It's ethically challenging. Commissioner Yamamoto brought it up and I, I don't like it, sorry. Um, I'll let another commissioner speak and then I'll ask my second question. So if I could jump in real quick. My questions and concerns come around adaptive management. Um, I was just spending kind of looking through the, the adaptive management section of the HCP and everything around adaptive management is assuming that it's not going according to plan and we're going to make adjustments um, in, in the direction of more conservation, more extreme measures. There are no triggers in the adaptive management plan that discuss what happens if it's going well. Where do we begin to get our forests back? So I have uh, the other piece in there as you read through all of the monitoring and who will look at that monitoring and who will make those decisions. Nowhere are we a part of any of that conversation. There are no triggers in adaptive management that indicate what happens if we have reduced our timber so far that A, the department can't survive or B, that our communities can't survive. So how do we build into adaptive management a piece that recognizes the importance of the survival of our communities so that at some point we are adaptively balancing, hey, maybe the owls aren't coming back. Maybe what, what Commissioner Bangs is talking about is, is happening. They're just frankly not coming back. And we're giving more and more, more, you know, uh, for us to try to make that happen. At what point do we actually stop and say, we've now lost how many jobs in our communities? We've now lost or how many mills will we lose? Where's that in there? How do we build that in? Because I think we all would very much like to see, you know, all of these species survive, but we also want to see our species survive. So how do we create a plan that actually acknowledges the need for balance that actually speaks to that? So I don't know if there's a way that can be incorporated into the HCP, but if we're going to do this for 70 years, wow, we need to have a way to assure that there's balance in that. Can you speak to that at all, Michael? Yeah, uh, Commissioner Scar, thank you. Um, the uh, so we're approaching that currently, and trying to work on that um, from a couple of different angles in the HCP. Uh, some of it actually tied to adaptive management triggers, and some of it actually just uh, tied to the implementation of the HCP. Um, and that's one of the difficult things about uh, large, broad documents uh, like an HCP. Um, I guess I would anchor back into like like our FNP. Um, in terms of how prescriptive they are and how implementation plays out over time. So we're trying to find the best places to address those, uh, those issues. Um, I will agree with you. I think a lot of times in adaptive management, uh, there's this tendency to look at the triggers and I, I guess to, in responding to a negative um, situation. Um, and, you know, how you might uh, adapt to that. One thing I would point out, I think our, you know, I realize this is, you know, maybe not terribly satisfying. I think our adaptive management plan uh, chapter uh, in the HCP does speak to whether we are under or overachieving uh, the biological goals and objectives. Um, however, it's not really just all, all about that um, piece. So I am not entirely sure what the mechanism would be to expressly 
build um, harvest volumes, jobs, or other economic metrics in as a trigger in the adaptive management plan. Um, I think it's more, um, I think it might be more tied to actually an uh, implementation question around cost and funding uh, of the HCP and how we would deal with those things. Um, and so maybe I'll just, if, if I can put Cindy on the spot for a second um, to, to help me out here. She might have a better answer, quite frankly, than I do. I believe that we are building in that provision for either, you know, if we are performing well with conservation, then we could potentially um, increase management and where we, you know, just kind of the opposite of that, which is usually where adaptive management focuses is that we're performing poorly, so we have to increase. So we're integrating both of those into the HCP. And in fact, we're talking with the scoping team right now a little bit around, does it belong in the um, chapter four, which is where conservation actions and strategies are located, which is basically our commitments, or do we put it in the adaptive management piece? But um, Commissioner Scar, I really appreciate your um, keen eye on the adaptive management piece of this because it is a 70 year plan and we need to be thinking about all of the different changes that could happen and making provisions as we as we can. So we are integrating that and I appreciate that you bringing that to our attention. Thank you, I appreciate that. I think the last piece I would say is just that um, where are the triggers for the when the economics are too deeply damaged? Because I think that's the part that doesn't necessarily happen. Um, and that I don't, I don't know how we build it in, I, but, but it's important. It's important to recognize that, that um, there is also has to be a trigger on the flip side, right? That is called out, that has something to the depth of when are the economics being too deeply damaged and th that we really have to, we have to stop. We have to, to draw a line on, on what we're doing toward conservation of the species. So I hear what you're saying, Cindy, and I appreciate that, that within that operational plan, you know, there's there's that piece where we're looking at if we're doing better, here's what we could do. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like there's just one other missing piece for us and for the people that we represent, which is at what point is the cut too deep? Um, and that we say, we're gonna just stop. We're gonna hold where we are. The owl gets only what they get because we have to maintain the socioeconomic pieces of this puzzle and how do we get that called out in the HCP or some commitment to that. I realize that the HCP, you know, the feds are going to look at that and they're going to have their pieces, but somehow that call out for us all. And I think that when my response to that is, I don't know if it's going to be terribly satisfying, but um, at any point, because it is so hard for us to forecast what socioeconomics are going to look like in the future. I mean, could any of us five years ago had imagined that we'd be going through a pandemic and be doing these meetings like we are? I mean, who knows what's going to happen? Um, so trying to kind of forecast, we're trying to do that as much as we can. But at any point, if the Board of Forestry thinks that the HCP is not serving us well or the communities well, um, they can choose not to participate and adhere to the incidental take permits. It means that we don't have take, we don't have any permits for take of species. So we are subject to litigation as we are now. And as you all know, we are currently being litigated. So that is, you know, the, the downside of that. But when we enter into these incidental take permit applications and issuance, as a landowner, it is our prerogative around whether or not we want to keep them. Now we've worked so hard and we do believe that having the assurance of being able to harvest for 70 years with the protection from litigation is really valuable to us as a public landowner. But at some point, if that isn't, then the board can make a different decision. Well, one one thing that I'd like to add uh, to that, a couple of things, a couple of things, if I can 
go back on the triggers and, and stuff. One, one of the safeguards of an HCP is a deal is a deal uh, and no surprises, right? So um, there are specific contingencies, you know, that are in there around certain foreseen circumstances and how we might, you know, adjust. And generally it's a temporary adjustment uh, to some planning to, to be able to accommodate a certain level of say disturbance. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, the services cannot require us to go above and beyond what we've said we would do. Um, and that's an important piece because it's kind of like, wow, you know, you guys aren't doing enough and, and we'd like you to do X, Y, and Z more for owls. And we can be like, huh, turns out we don't have to. Uh, I mean, that's at the brass tax level. That's, that's how it is at the end of the day. Um, the other thing that I would uh, kind of add on there is, um, well, actually, I guess that's, that's probably good. That's probably good for now. I mean, that, that's the main thing is a deal is a deal. And so we do have that sort of baseline. I, um, I guess actually I will piling on to what Cindy said, and I don't want to get this conversation off the rails. I realize you guys have a lot to do here, but um, if we do bail out of an HCP, um, that is something we can do. The services, by the way, can't. As long as we are in compliance with our HCP, they cannot take it away from us, regardless of how bad things are going for species. Um, we, however, can elect to leave. If we leave that agreement, um, we would be, as Cindy said, back under incidental take guidelines, however, or an incidental take environment, which obvi obviously doesn't have the greatest guidelines or <laughs> there wouldn't be so much uncertainty, but um, we also would have to deal with how much take has occurred in the interim um, that perhaps has not been fully mitigated by the strategies. And so there's a few things that help us out with that. There's a stay ahead provision. So we're not overcutting um, habitat, removing too much habitat early in the term of the HCP uh, and that kind of thing as we go along to, to really try and make sure that doesn't happen. And that's a safeguard uh, for the services as well so that they don't have someone who comes in, front loads all their take and then says, oh, we don't need this anymore. Um, and uh, you know, it's so, and then if we decide we don't need it, it actually turns out to work fairly well for us in that uh, we probably haven't gone too far off course and there's not a lot of unmitigated take that we would have to respond to to get out of the agreement. Um, and that's a really technical and difficult process, uh, but just kind of want to put out there that that's kind of part of, part of the getting out of an HCP. Thank you, I appreciate the information. Thank you, Commissioner Stark, for that for that question. Uh, I, I want to just um, go a little deeper into that, if I may, take a very small detour. Um, but this HCP, the way Council of the Forest Trust Land Counties is looking at this HCP, it's, it's going to affect counties not only in timber revenue, uh, but in jobs. Um, and, and we have huge issues. Uh, with the number of jobs per million board feet that is, is being, the way it's being calculated in, in the EIS. Uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, so just like the counties losing much revenue, not only in, in timber revenue, but in, in jobs, et cetera, um, this is going to impact ODF in a huge way economically, another socioeconomic impact, if you will. Uh, do, does the department have have a plan in place once it, if this HCP were to be put in place uh, to find additional funding? Are you have you been in conversation with the legislature to figure out how you're going to fill your deficits? I mean, that's one thing we keep talking about the deficits for the county. Uh, I've yet to hear a plan from the department on how how they plan on, on filling your deficits. So we are not currently um, approaching the legislature with, with any uh, solutions. We are, you know, still um, looking at our current funding model uh, for state forests. However, you know, that may change in the near future. And that actually is regardless of HCP or not. Um, there is a desire to have more stability um, across the board 
in, in how we're approaching uh, and, and, and how we're funded. Um, and, you know, I think sometimes that's seen as, a, you know, it's difficult for us, right? It's, it's difficult when, um, well, gosh, this is, has worked out well for so long, but then a lot of people don't realize the uh, severe limitations that we've made in the past, um, you know, deliberate decisions, but still had major consequences for our budget and were difficult uh, for us. Um, you know, I, the recession is a key example during the recession, you know, in order to keep, you know, we, and, and we made this decision together, right, is uh, at that time uh, with you all, I was like, yeah, we're not gonna lower our harvest levels or the, or the, or the amount that we ho offer, right? So we stuck with our um, targets um, and offered that volume. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, really took it in the shorts on that. Um, but, you know, the, the objective there wasn't our funding. There wasn't the FDF. The objective was jobs, local economies, and, and trying, to, trying to move that forward. And I don't really see that changing in the future. I don't know that those decisions would be a lot different. Um, I mean, they, they might be. It, it kind of depends. But that's an example of one of the reasons that we would go uh, why we will be going and looking for a better way to balance our funding, not only for us, but um, for you all too, quite frankly. Um, you know, on those sales, for instance, during the recession, very low stumpage, um, you know, we actually lost money on those sales. Um, and while you didn't actually lose money, you didn't get as much as you could have right? Because of the timing of that. So we all know that's out there. Um, it would be nice to be able to provide those sorts of things in a more secure environment, um, for sure. Because um, they have long lasting effects. Uh, you know, it's, it takes a while for that timber. You know, we're, we're subject to those prices for a while <laughs> um, on our contracts. So anyway, uh, sorry, I, I go on and on, but uh, we don't have any current efforts. We do intend uh, to look for some creative solutions, uh, probably not this legislative session, but the uh, subsequent one. Yeah. Uh, Chair Yamamoto. Chair May. Um, you know, after reading the uh, appellate court's decision, I began to wonder. So I went over to our county clerk's office and looked up this deed here, and it says. Known by all men present at Coos County Public Corporation in the state of Oregon in consideration of a dollar or other good and valuable consideration to be paid by the state of Oregon has bargained and sold and by these presents does grant, bargain and sell, convey said state of Oregon through the use of its Department of Forestry, its successors and assigns pursuant to the provision of Chapter 478, Oregon Law, 1939, and this was dated. This deed was dated the first day of July of 1940. So, when you look up 478 in Section 4, the board may permit permit the use of state forests and the lands connected therewith for grazing, recreation, and other purposes. When, in the opinion of the board, such use does not and will not impair or be injurious or detrimental to any of the purposes of this act, which means to me that if you do the HCP or anything else, you're in violation of this <laughs> deed and it would make it null and void, but I'll have to talk to counsel about that. Interesting discovery, Commissioner May. In a, in, a, in a court of appeals, they talked about the 41 Act, but we sold ours under the, the 39 Act, which is about, I think we have 1%, about 7,000 plus acres. Thank you, Commissioner Main. I'm not sure anybody can, can respond to that at this point, because I'm sure you haven't seen that before, but um, good for thought. Yep. Thank you, Bob. Other questions? Commissioner Sweet, go ahead. Uh, you are muted, John. John, you are muted. There, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate this conversation about the dollars. You know, I, 
I, I view the Oregon Department of Forestry as one of the most venerable of all the state departments and that there can't help but be an impact upon their finances if we shut down 55% of the county forest trust lands to harvest. We, we're, we're, we're cruelly aware of what's happened here in the county. We know what the impact will be upon the county's finances and upon the various taxing districts. But has the board, has the department really made the Board of Forestry aware, not only that you don't have a finance plan for the department once you give shut down 55% of the lands, but you're not the only institution in the state that benefits from these forests. About 45 plus or minus percent of the share of revenues coming off of trust lands that go to the counties are distributed to the school districts. And if they lose a major part of that 45%, it's made up for out of the state's uh, uh, school equity program. So, so in essence, this, the state, uh, you do the numbers, it's, it's about 30% of, of the funds that go to the county come back to the state. In, 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 uh, because they, they offset what the state has to pay to equalize opportunity for all the students in the state. So if we cut this down, it's going to cost the state that money too. In addition to in addition to what they what percentage of the revenues you get to run the Department of Forestry beyond, the state also gets a big share, in essence, of uh, to uh, that in, that is impacted by school equalization. And in in the end, uh, the state really gets about two thirds of those revenues and the counties and uh, local taxing districts other than the schools get about a third. And is the board aware of that? Is the legislature aware of that? It, you know, have people thought that through? It's a lot of money. And the other thing is, if we see it very clearly here in Coos County. We have a variety of public ownerships. We have Forest Service land, we have BLM land, we have state lands, state school board lands, and I guess thankfully maybe not very many acres of county forest trust lands. But we've seen the Forest Service, and those, there's no harvest on there. The BLM has between wagon road lands and Owen Sea Lands, probably close to 300,000 acres of timber. That's all been, 90% of that's been put into reserves since 2016. And the Elliott, 60,000 acres of that are in, 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 in our county. It, we lost that too. Now, there's been a hell of a gain in habitat when you add this all together but it's been a huge loss to our communities. And it creates a, a lot of need for social services, which generally come from the state. So there's another cost. I, I just, I, I can't believe that we can, in good conscience, shut down 55% of our county forest trust lands. The social impact, the economic impact is huge. And I don't know that people are aware of that to the degree that they should be. You know, you, the Oregon Department of Forestry, knows it's going to happen, but you don't have a plan for it that I can see. You just said you didn't. Does the Board of Forestry know that? I'm sure they do. They should. But have they asked for it? And has the legislature and has the governor's office asked for that? Or have you made them aware? And this is just one of the things, you know, we talked about 
deficiencies in the amount of information the Board of Forestry seemed to know about the EIS? And have you really taken the time and the energy and the effort to make the Board of Forestry and other parts of our state government aware of the impact of about what we're of what we are about to do? Uh, yeah, so Commissioner Sweet, thank you for that. And, you know, absolutely, the board is aware of the potential uh, impacts. They also are aware that, you know, we need to model out the forest management plan, different scenarios there uh, under this to really understand the ramifications better. Um, you know, there's some indication of it in the EIS, and of course, there was some, uh, quite a bit of work there done actually to point out the uh, uh, the local taxing districts and counties and the specific impacts there to the revenue. Um, so the board is acutely aware and as are we. Um, and then, you know, let, as for the legislature, I will say that, uh, you know, that varies a lot depending on uh, your individual legislator. Uh, I'd say that those that represent you and hear from you uh, quite a lot uh, probably are acutely aware of it. And, you know, I really appreciate you, uh, and I, I realize this is not the first time you've done it, pointing out this really is kind of one big pot of money at the end of the day, right? I mean, these services are being provided and a lot of this stuff ends up supporting a service that the state general fund would otherwise uh, support, uh, you know, especially, uh, especially with the school equalization uh, piece. So uh, yes, we are aware um, and um, didn't mean to indicate that we don't, we're not putting any thought into this when I said we don't have any current legislative concepts that we're going forward to the legislature with. Um, part of our strategic in, uh, work internally is to begin to take these uh, in conjunction with the modeling outputs we get and a, a better idea of what those revenues might be in the future and seeing how we right size or change our organizational structure to accommodate that. Um, and, you know, is there a point there where we just don't have enough? I mean, that's certainly a key question and certainly something that the board has to consider in their final decision um, on whether or not to, to adopt and implement rather uh, incidental take permits. Let, let me play off of that just for a minute and I'll, I'll be quiet for the rest of the meeting. Um, you, you, you have a backup plan. You, you, you can shrink the size of your organization as perhaps. Uh, you can go to the state legislature for general fund funding. You always have that backup. I, I don't know that we have that. In fact, I know damn well we do not. And this, this can hurt a lot of people. You just can't take 55% out of the harvest base without having a lot of social suffering and economic suffering. John, can I, I, I'd like to kind of take us back to, uh, you know, we're in this pathway of doing an HCP. And the reason I think that, we, you know, we have to require uh, we have to comply with the Endangered Species Act. And there's right. a couple of ways we can do that. We can do take avoidance or we can go down the route of HCP. The current HCP seems to be one that would be bought off by the services. And, um, and so I guess the determination is, are we better off doing take avoidance or going down the route of HCP? So far, I think our, our analysis, I think we're we would be more stable under an HCP. Uh, if we do not have the HCP, for example, the coho litigation, that be, starts looming, it's, which is going on right now and may have significant impacts on the way we manage a, a riparian habitat um, on the state forest. Murrelets, uh, as they come up with more rules. But the great thing about it, about HCP, is that once it's locked in, we're locked in. And I think that's what also inspired private industry to try to do the, the PFA. Uh, and I think that's where we start. Now, yeah, John, taking timber off the, the rolls or holding it back does have an economic impact and we're gonna have to deal with it. From the standpoint of 
the state, yeah, we, we have some, you know, you're right. We have alternatives and funding that the counties don't have. Like we have for this organization, we can roll back the organization. We can go to the, the uh, legislators and ask for more general fund. Uh, I'm doing that right now, trying to, to pay off prioritization right now. The bullet that's sh shooting at me is this $80 million net fire costs, large fire costs I have to deal, we have to deal with. Uh, so it's really a prioritization. If we're going to start, we have talked, and my board knows about these, these, these are big problems. And, you know, my board has talked to me and individuals have said, what are we going to do if we have significant reductions on, on, um, you know, I think that significant reductions at, on a state forest. And so they are aware of it. And, and those alternatives have not been planned out, you know, specifically. We don't even know how this thing's going to turn out and what restrictions are exactly going to be. The EIS is looking at the range. They've, the services have already determined that there's going to be a significant impact to the, the human environment. So they did an EIS. Otherwise, they would have done an EA. Uh, but anyway, that's, you know, I, those are some of the things that we're dealing with, John. I think the significance is there. It all rounds, rolls back to barred owls. I mean, uh, spotted owls are a listed species, coho. I mean, we have a lot of endangered and species that are required by federal legis legislation or federal rule that we comply with. And I guess the question is, how do we comply with it? That's all, I, you know, that's, that's, that's what I have to add. I, I know, John, maybe we, you and I need to have some coffee, but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Cal, I, I know it's got to be as frustrating for you as it is for me. It just. Yeah, we haven't talked with each other for a while, but I, you know, this is, this is not easy, you know, and. Uh, I know that. You know. I'm not being critical of our Department of Forestry. We're just in something that's very difficult and very wow. frustrating. Yeah, I had a great uh, visit yesterday with one of our major landowners, you know, in the Coos County. And, uh, and seeing the things, the way they treat their lands and so on, you know, I know they're that you know we're doing a lot out there for the environment we are doing things for mitigation of climate change uh but we are required to us we are required to comply with the endangered species act thank you uh commissioner banks i know you've been waiting patiently i, I just need to throw something in here also i mean this is a very interesting conversation uh, it's, it is my feeling that Oregon is at a tipping point, a huge tipping point. Um, we have lost so many mills over the past two or three decades. Uh, and we have companies out there, um, um, the Manulife, the Warehousers, um, the Rosebergs, um, the, the, the Stimpsons, the Hamptons. They do terrific forest management for sustainable harvest. They, they do great work. Uh, and I know they're concerned. This is a huge issue. We're at it. If we lose many more mills, these we're going to start to see these companies exit Oregon. Then we're going to be in a true death spiral. Uh, and that and this HCP is absolutely not helping uh, that whole scenario. Uh, I know there's no direct answer to that, um, but it's something that I'm looking at very carefully right now. We cannot afford to get into that death spiral, uh, which this HCP is starting to kick us over the edge as far as I'm concerned. Uh, although it is much more than that also. Uh, so, the one question that comes up here, you know, we're working diligently on this HCP. Is this the only HCP that is going to be acceptable to the Fed? Can't we rework this? Yes, it's going to take time. Uh, and we're going to have to almost start over. Uh, but let's look at what happened with the private forest accord. Is there a different HCP, one that isn't so onerous uh, to the counties? Uh, and to the rural, uh, rural Oregon. I mean, I, I don't know. This one just see, I, I know you've been working on this. So we have been working on this a long time and we've been arguing against it for a long time. Um, but now is it time now to take another look at this particular HCP? 
Is there a better deal that can be made to get those protections? So, um, you know, while, while I will say, um, you know, we, we feel like, you know, we've, we've done a lot of work with the services to get to this point and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, you know, I personally believe this is a good quality HCP, however, and with a high chance of success. However, um, if you were talking about abandoning this process and starting over, and is there some other potential HCP design uh, that could pass the muster? Um, I, well, I mean, sure, there's a lot of possibilities, but that's a really open-ended sort of a thing, right? Um, because if you're asking me what, if you're asking me what else would pass muster, I don't know, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> we put a lot of effort into this uh, to, to get to this point. And we understand where we're at in the strategies with the services. But um, I think the, the thing there would be, you know, starting over involves a lot of risk. And so is the board willing to accept that risk in the interim and the time that it would take to make it happen? Um, you know, and there's, there's looming issues associated with that. Um, we're all aware of the coho litigation, of course, which goes to trial early next year. Um, correct me wherever I'm wrong, Justin. I believe that is uh, what we anticipate the schedule to be. We go into trial. We don't know the outcome of that. Um, the other thing I would point to, and I don't know that many people have seen this, but on June 28th, Judge Aiken uh, provided a ruling that basically affirmed the PSG protocol in detail um, and also um, affirmed uh, in that that any certified surveyor, um, while uh, I, I, I need to put this delicately. Any certified surveyor, officially trained and certified, their results are valid, um, unless otherwise somehow proven not. Um, and so while from a scientific and objective manner, I think that's fine. Uh, when people are properly trained and they go out and they see things, then great, that's data. Um, but it also presents a certain risk to us, okay? Uh, so, Elliot, that, that is the risk. I, 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 you know, to be perfectly clear on that. So, that's what we're hoping to, to avoid. So, these, these things are out there. They're happening currently. Um, I think I've mentioned before the red tree bowl was, uh, you know, they decided not to not to list it, but that's already being litigated again. Um, it's a very, it's a difficult and uncertain uh, future without some kind of agreement with the services on that. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, the answer to your question is, is pretty simple. I mean, yeah, you know, if you're willing to accept the risk of that, then there's a lot of, you know, that maybe there are other potential options out there. Thank you for that answer, Michael. Appreciate it very much. And, and Commissioner Banks, I'm so sorry, but please go ahead. Uh, no worries. I was going to just do a follow up comment to this conversation and then ask my question. But um, it sounds like, though, that this was the only plan that ODF drafted and then took to the feds. It sounds like you didn't provide a range of plans, you just provided the one. Um, and it, you know, can't, can't federal services extend? Um, the two-year timeline if requested and you provide a revised supplemental EIS with better alternatives um, and that's just if you could answer that and then I'll get into my my second question. Regarding um, the so how the HCP was developed you know we didn't just draft it and take it to them so there's there's that point we worked through the discussion on particular points um, and you know got this sort of agreement along the way. Now they can't be pre-decisional and say that, yes, this is the HCP that works. I mean, they, they've got a process, they can't do that. Everybody knows that, okay, good. But 
uh, we feel very comfortable with the process we went through because we did go through it very stepwise with the scoping team. And that's not just the services, it's also ODFW, DEQ, DSL. Um, so, so there's but not that. the counties. I'm just going to insert there, but not the counties. I, we are coming in on the backside of the conversation. So keep going. Sorry. And so we, uh, as, as we move forward, is it possible for them to get an extended timeline? Um, they could make that request, I suppose. I don't know what the channels are for them to make that request. We know what their current regs are with uh, NOAA Fisheries is their two-year deadline. Um, so could they do more? I actually don't have the answer to whether or not there would be any room for them to get an extension. Um, and uh, if there was, you know, so. Okay. Um, I, I thought the answer was going to be yes, it's in the rules, but um, anyhow, or the new rules, but anyhow, um, I'm going to move on to my, my second question or, or thought process. I've already verbalized um, my discontent with the no action data. I've been pretty thorough on, on how I feel about all of our comparisons being made to no action data um, that I have openly stated is, is a false set of data. Um, but I was gonna ask a question regarding these assumptions made. Um, so you, you made a set of assumptions that includes growth of a species, the, the spotted owl, um, that are listed. It's a, it's a listed species. And then it also includes, at the same time, an unlisted species that's going to become listed, which I feel is very counterintuitive, um, considering that you've tied those two species together. And so this vision that you have for our future, you haven't shown, this is a very teacher phrase, shown your work. Um, you, you haven't shown us why you feel like these two assumptions um, in, that, that you put into the no modeling data, the, the no action modeling data. Um, you haven't shown us why you feel that these two assumptions that our entire future is tied to, why that's going to work. Or, or why, that, why that is to be. Um, spotted owls. It's just counterintuitive. And granted, those things are very hard to predict. So I, I appreciate that. I, I do want to make sure everybody understands too is, is you know, we did not, our, our modeling, you know, a lot of our modeling data and our forest model was used for the EIS. Um, the no action alternative and the proposed action, specifically those model solutions that came out and the assumptions associated with those are from the comparative analysis uh, from 2020 and were, you know, they were not, um, you know, our purpose in using those at the time was to evaluate the risk, business risk for us uh, with uh, continuing undertaking avoidance versus the HCP. And I, I have, I do know that, you know, as we're, as we're starting, as a contractor starting to assemble these comments um, uh, and work with us, in terms of understanding them and how they're going to eventually respond to them in the final EIS, um, you know, the, your concerns are noted in there, um, and probably not. I assume multiple uh, folks probably commented that way, but that is captured in in there for the EIS. So to the effect that um, the services agree or disagree with um, any of the assumptions and any of the modeling that was done and choose to uh, make adjustments, that that'll be reflected. Okay, I guess I'm just very fascinated um, that with this choice of, of development of, I guess, following this, this plan, we're, we're going to get owls back, but then our red retrieval is going to be delisted or, or listed, I mean. Um, and so those two species you've tied together, 
And so I, I, my thought process is, is if the owls are going to come back, obviously the red tree voles are going to be healthy because they're tied together. And so why are we worried about the red tree vole? But again, I'm, I'm just pointing out something that I feel is counterintuitive. And I'm going to circle back to, I really would like ODF to show me, show me their work. Uh, show me your calculations that brought you to, to this point. Um, because when I'm looking at these HCAs, they're huge. And you mentioned to a, a board of forestry member in a previous conversation that you put enough in enough habitat and potential habitat into this plan to account for a Columbus Day size storm. And for those of you who are not aware of what that, that scope is, that's huge. That's, that's, so you front loaded this plan with, with trees, acres, potential habitat, you, you front loaded it. And what I see from my, my chair that I'm sitting in is that you front loaded this plan with job loss. And so how many jobs can, could I have gotten back because so, there's, there's a calculation missing that I would like to see, and that's the calculation of how much is needed versus how much was given. And for riparian zones, there's a plethora of citations that show me how much is needed. For our HCAs and our corridors, there's no associated citations that say how much was needed. And so when you're putting out into the world that we, we will adhere to our promises to the scope of a Columbus Day storm, which is a 50 year event on the North Coast that decimated hundreds of thousands of acres. And that we had to salvage harvest hundreds of thousands of acres. And then the only comparison I have is a 2007 storm that I was alive for and our our older folks said the 2007 storm wasn't as bad as Columbus Day, but I know how much ODF had to salvage harvest. And I know how much our private industry had to salvage harvest from that. And so when you say that there's enough front loaded in this plan to account for that, I see front loaded job loss. I see ODF job loss. I see defunding of multiple situations. And somebody brought, brought Commissioner Sweet brought up school equity. Um, I can attest as a, as a rural school district parent that there is no school equity um, between rural and municipality schools. My children do not receive equitable education. They do not receive multiple foreign languages. They do not receive um, theater and all of those extras. They get the bare minimum. They get the bare minimum. And so I wanna see that calculation. What did we have to give versus what did we give? And, and I wanna see that scientific citation of, of like, show me why. And, and so I hope, I hope that you can share that information with the Board of Forestry when they're making this decision. Because if, it, if this is a decision that was, was created in a room of opinion um, without scientific notation and scientific um, foundation, We've got economic job loss across the board that Commissioner Scar was speaking to. So I guess two questions is show me your work. That's, that's my teacher speak. Show me your calculations, show me your work. How did we get here in regards to the HCAs? Cause I know how we got here in regards to the riparian zones. And then you made a set of assumptions and we're, we're throwing all our hopes and dreams into a set of assumptions that are counterintuitive. And so why are those set of assumptions counterintuitive? Okay, so yeah, thank you for that. I, you know, I, I get, I'm a little bit of a loss, I suppose. I mean, with uh, HCAs and what is actually required. Um, there is no um, specific calculation. I would expect that to come from the services. Um, if there was like a line in the sand of just how much is for this, that, and the other. 
And so that is why the network is designed to be, uh, to have some, uh, well, to have management within it, quite frankly. And um, we are working, as we've said, to look at what the adjustments to that uh, management might be over time. Um, you know, landscape design principles essentially would be, uh, I think, the sort of um, citation, if you will, that would underpin that. Uh, things around interior habitat more generally for species um, and abundance and configuration uh, principles like we use in our current forest management plan. Uh, you know, there's a lot of that work um, that was done. I don't know if any of that can be brought to bear uh, on that. Michael, thank you, Christian Bangs. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to reiterate that, you know, that what I'm looking for is there's abundant um, support for our riparian zones um, and size, breadth, depth. There doesn't seem so. What I'm what I'm receiving from you is that there's no set research that states that the size of these HCAs is going to work, or that this process. I mean, we've already established that federal services knows that this isn't going to help the spotted owl. Um, they will continue to decline. They stated that in their analysis. So. I guess I'm just wondering why we think that this is going to work. Why is it going to be different than other people's results? So those are good questions. And I mean, obviously, you know, in terms of the testing of our actual HCA design, I mean, that is what it is. I don't have I don't have an exact uh, landscape design that we can test the same way, right? Because we haven't done it, done it before. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Executive Director Nickel, Gina. Uh, Michael, I just have a couple questions because I want to make sure. Gina, um, your sound is cutting in and out. Uh, yes. I'm problems. Is this better? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, I guess one of the questions that I have is um, going back to the beginning, and I hate to be so, um, I, I feel like I'm going back to the first grade on this, uh, wanting to understand. But um, in, in my experience, watching over this for the last 35 years, I'm having a hard time understanding where we changed focus. Meaning my understanding is that when, when we started, these were county lands that were held in trust by the state um, for the greatest permanent value. And I wonder if the change of definition of greatest permanent value has been changed since the beginning of time and if, if, if we're still the, the customers, the owner of the land that this is held in trust for, I'm not sure why we weren't at the table sooner. Is there something that the federal government is doing to us or somebody that, that the HCP wouldn't be more of a, uh, a participatory with, with the counties? I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, um, it, it just, Clearly, our, our role has changed in the last seven years, and it's, it's very concerning to me because in the 90s, when I was a commissioner, we seemed to be partners, and we work very well with Cal and all of you, but it, it seems like we're not, we're not partners anymore in, in this. And so my question is, is how, how can we have influence on when we see our, our economics dying, what, what do we need to do uh, differently and, and how I'm, I'm concerned about what Commissioner Sweet said, you know, 55% um, shut, we, we've got to do some different planning and it, it, it feels like, um, it, it just feels somewhere like our land has not 
you know, wh when did we become the, the junior um, partner and really not have much say so in this? So uh, thank you. Um, I will respond to that and just say, I'm going to try to keep myself out of the litigation realm yes. with this. Um, but some of these things do touch on that point. And so, you know, uh, in terms of the trust uh, relationship, you know, it is not a formal statutory trust. Mm -hmm. Those do exist, and that is not the context in which these lands are held. Um, clearly, the counties are, um, in, in terms of the financials, a, a beneficiary of any of the revenues that come off this land, and that is a very important thing. Um, I do not want to suggest that it's not uh, an important thing, and so it is. Regarding the, uh, I guess to talk about the litigation a little bit, regarding this process, initially um, we, uh, the counties uh, and ODF were engaged together. Uh, there were regular updates at several FTLAC meetings, um, and that was in the early phase of HCP development. Um, unfortunately, the timing of trial um, in the Lynn County case led to a number of cancellations of FTLAC meetings and then the pandemic um, also exacerbated uh, uh, that. Um, and so that is where some, uh, a lot of uh, valuable contact was lost um, during that time. Thank you for your response. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Bangs, I see you have your hand up again. Um, yeah, I did. Um, I was just going to request uh, again. Um, we have all of us circling back, and we have the Board of Forestry circling back and comparing, com comparing what is the decision that they're going to make on the no action data. And I've pointed out in the past that the no action, not, no action data is false due to us loading owls into it that don't exist. And um, my request is that we remodel this data set with actuals and rerun it so that we can have a more factual outlook on potential economic impacts or lack thereof, on potential litigation or lack thereof. Um, because knowing, for me personally, knowing that this data set is inherently false, um, I feel like there's a giant sidebar missing from the room. And of course, when you compare this HCP to the no action data, it says that you know everything kind of is pretty close in the results, so it's not so bad. But knowing how the modeling was loaded um, and knowing that it's not what is actually occurring out here or in any of our forests, um, I, I would just like to see a more factual comparison so that the folks that are, are, are able to make this decision are actually seeing the whole picture. And so I'm asking ODF to do additional model, modeling and inform our, our board members who are making this decision with, with a, a better picture of, of what is actually occurring um, in our state force. <coughs> Okay, um, so we're getting close to our time and I'd love to give people um, part of their Friday back. Um, Doug Robertson, Doug, I, I see that you unmuted. Did you have a comment to make? Oh, a fascinating discussion. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I requested uh, the study that, that uh, Courtney mentioned earlier. I've, I've reviewed some of the same information regarding the barred owls and the spotted owls with the same findings that uh, that Courtney uh, mentioned. Um, 
it looks like the process is the trains going down the track. It's going to be pretty hard to stop it. Um, we've been there before. So a lot of good comments. I know uh, ODF is doing the best they can do given the restrictions they're working under. But um, I think Gina's comments that there seems to have been a, uh, it's evolved over time where we've lost contact. Uh, we don't communicate the way we did historically with, uh, uh, with the state and the counties. And I know, David, you're trying to uh, rebuild some of that and, and you have with a lot of your efforts, but um, the fact of the matter is the, um, <clears throat> the state with the backing of uh, NOAA Fisheries, U.S. Fish and Wildlife make it pretty difficult for our input to um, really um, make much difference. Thank you, Doug. You know, I really, I really do appreciate you being here. I do. Uh, you are a sage, uh, sage council in all things forestry. We really appreciate it so much. Okay, um, so any other comments? I have just one, and I, I want to sort of take the poll of the commissioners. So uh, previously, before the pandemic, FTLAC used to meet in person, in Salem. Uh, and I think we lose something when we're like this on virtual calls. Um, and speaking with Mike Wilson, I know he said, you know, there may be a possibility that we could start to meet in person again. Um, and I just want to take the temperature. Is that something? I think we would still have to offer a, a virtual option, uh, but getting back together again in person around the table, I feel really could have some advantages. Uh, and if, if indeed this board is saying that, yes, maybe that's a good idea, uh, maybe we should move the meeting time. I, I, I'm not sure Fridays are a bad day. Friday afternoons might not be the best. And I haven't, haven't talked with Mike about this at all. Uh, if even Friday mornings might be a possibility somewhere at ODF. Um, but I, I just, want, just want everyone, especially the commissioners, please weigh in on whether you think meeting in person again uh, is a good thing, something that you could, uh, you could do. Leanne is giving me a thumbs up. Commissioner Banks, Commissioner Magruder, Commissioner Scar, Commissioner Sweet, uh, and I'm trying, oh yes, Commissioner Willie, Commissioner Tucker. Uh, okay, uh, and so you need, everyone needs to understand, and you may not to recall this, you may be your commissioners in, um, but any commissioner from Council of Forest Trust Land Counties uh, is welcome, and you have a seat at the table along with the FTLAC board members. Uh, so just please keep that in mind. Uh, we, want, we want you to be here, we want your input. Uh, again, I'll work with Mike to see when our next FTLAC meeting is and um, ask if, if it may be possible that we could get together. Um, but does Friday morning make more sense than Friday afternoon? Give me some nods or no's. Yeah, yeah, okay. 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 I, again, please understand that we will continue to have a virtual op option if you can't make it. And we certainly understand. So, uh, any other anything else for the good of the order? Hey, we're going to give you 14 minutes of your Friday afternoon back. How about that? Thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been a, a great meeting. I think we covered a lot of ground today. Uh, Mike and staff, again, we appreciate you being here. We, we realize we're taking up your Friday afternoons also. We, 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 we know that. So again, thanks everyone for being here. And we'll hopefully everyone, we'll see everyone on the Board of Forestry meeting on the 20th. Thanks so much. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you.